so I don't know, this, this time of year, we start thinking about gifts. We start thinking about gifts that maybe you want. You start thinking about gifts that you're going to be giving to other people. And, and I don't know what you might think the best gift is, but I'm going to lay it down for you right now so all of us know what the best gift is ever that you could ever give to anybody. And you're thinking, what is this? Because I need to go shopping next week. I mean, you're like, you're, you looked on Amazon and nothing's coming up. And, and this is the best gift ever. The multi-tool, okay? And I know some of y'all are thinking, no, it's not, but yes, it is. And I will tell you why this is, because there are so many times that I need something and I don't have it. But when you get a multi-tool from somebody, it's not one gift, it's like 27 gifts in one. That, that shows you that they care about you, okay? And so the multi-gift says, no matter what you face in life, you can handle it with this, it's just this confidence booster. And I, I don't know, uh, the, not just for guys. The ladies can wield the multi-tool like nobody's business, okay? And, and, and there are some ladies that would run circles around guys with an entire set of tools. And a woman has this and she will outdo a guy. And, and so the multi-tool is amazing. And, and this is what is true. I'm kind of like the... I, I, or at least I like to think of myself as like the MacGyver where I can like, like rig up or fix anything and, and you give me a multi-tool, some duct tape and a paper clip and I will make you a rocket, okay? And so, so, so but here's the thing is that uh, uh, to have one of these in your car means you're prepared for just like whatever. Change a transmission, no problem, okay? <laughs> Maybe, but, but here's the thing is that the multi-tool is, is great because it, whatever you come up against or face, then, then you whip something. You need a screwdriver, you got a screwdriver. You, you need to cut something, you can cut something. You, you, need to, you need to clamp on something, grip it, you got pliers. I mean, just so usable. And, and this is the thing is that a great gift is a gift that you can use and that you need and it's beneficial. And that's the truth with a multi-tool, I believe. And so what I want to do with this multi-tool is I want to give it away. But th this is what I was thinking is I don't want to give this to somebody that needs it for themselves. You're looking for a gift for somebody and you need this to give to somebody. And so maybe you've got a Christmas party coming up at work and you're like, I don't have time to go to the store. Then, then maybe this is for you. Or maybe you've got a brother or somebody or a sister or whatever and, and you want to give them this for Christmas. Then I want to give this to you. So, so who would like this? You, you're going to give this away. You're going to give this away. Uh, oh man, there's so many. Now, now I'm going to choose somebody and the rest of you are going to be like, Pastor doesn't like me. So I'm just going to... Um, Hey, Aaron, come on up, y'all. Give it up for Aaron. Uh, we're going to give this to Aaron. Man, uh, so uh, what I want to do is uh, I want you to maybe like a, a give this to somebody. Tell them that Jesus loves them and you know what you're going to do. Y'all, this is what he's going to do. Here you go. He's going to give them this invite too along with it. Amen. Aaron, we love you, man. Appreciate you, Aaron. Y'all give it up for Aaron. Thanks, man. Okay, so... So, so here's the thing is that this multi-tool, one of the reasons why it is so great is because it can do just about anything. And whatever you're facing, whatever you need, you've got this thing that can help meet that need in your life. And, and I was thinking about that because as we're moving into the Christmas season and, and the Christmas story, it's a story about how God came into our lives to meet a need, a need that you and I were not equipped to fix, a, a need that you and I were not equipped to meet. But Jesus is available no matter what we're facing, no matter the struggle, no matter the challenge or situation. God and Jesus has got what it takes to get us through that, to, to, to do a work in our lives. And so as I was thinking about this, a couple scriptures came to mind. One in John, 1 John 4, 9 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. Th that was an issue we couldn't fix on our own. But Jesus came to do that work in our lives and to solve that issue in our lives. And, and that scripture made me think about Jesus coming to this world. And in the Old Testament, there's these prophecies about this, the, the Jesus, this Messiah that's going to come and, and, and correct things that, that for generations were out of order, that for generations people couldn't solve, but Jesus could. And, and so in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it, we're, we're, we can read this promise about Jesus. And it says, 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Then those names that are given to Jesus are these different aspects of his character and how he moves in our lives. That Jesus isn't just this single facet that to make sure that you have salvation and that you don't spend eternity in hell and that's all that Jesus provides. No, Jesus uh, branches out into many areas, all the areas of our lives to, to bring us the solutions that we need in our relationships, in our finances, in our hopes, in our dreams, in our emotions, in our mind. He, he provides all of these answers to these questions that we face in life that left on our own, we are ill-equipped to deal with. And so I was thinking about those names, and I want us to look at uh, here in this message the, these names and how they can play out in our lives and, and these, the, the, the different functions that Jesus has available to us to bring victory into our lives. And so number one, this is what I thought is that being a wonderful counselor, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, for the decisions in life I have a wonderful counselor. For the decisions in life... I have a wonderful counselor. I don't know if you've ever been through something, dealing with something, and hopefully there comes a point to where you don't try to carry that on your own, but you seek some advice from some people. It's hard going through life alone. It's hard facing circumstances and troubles and try to deal with it yourself. We need some people in our lives, hopefully some Christ-centered relationships that can speak wisdom into our lives. And that's what Jesus does. He's a wonderful counselor. And if I'm honest, I need that wisdom. You and I need that. We don't have it figured out. We don't understand all the aspects of what we need to understand. We need Jesus' perspective for the things we face in life. Otherwise, we're going to be going down the wrong track until we finally realize, oh, this isn't working. And we try to shift course. And we need some wisdom when it comes to that. Decisions in life, man, some of us are maybe thinking, is this relationship worth investing in and holding on, or do I need to let go of this, and do I need to move forward? That, that's a decision some people need. Maybe where finances are concerned, you're thinking, do I need to invest? Do I need to save? Should I pay off this debt? Should I put money in here? Should, should I start giving more? And you're thinking, financially, what am I supposed to do? You need wisdom. You, you need some wonderful counselor to give you some advice to say, this is what needs to happen in your life. We, we need wisdom in our life. And I can tell you, even as pastor, people come to me and uh, I uh, uh, oftentimes can carry the weight of many people's problems because they come to me and say, hey, this is going on. This is going on. What should I do? And I'm like, I don't know what you should do. I mean, I just really don't know. And, and, but here's the thing is that I don't have to know because he knows. And this is what I do whenever I'm meeting with somebody. I pray and I say, God, show us your wisdom for this circumstance. Show us your wisdom for the choices that need to be made here. And here's the thing is we have a wonderful counselor that gives us the advice that we need to lead us into that direct path and where we need to go. I was thinking that uh, oftentimes I have people ask me, Pastor, how do you come up with stuff to talk about at church? I, I've had that ad. Many people ask me that like, like every single week. Isn't that, isn't that difficult? Like you, uh, messages and series and all that. Like, like how do you figure that out? How do you decide? And, uh, most people don't know this, but when you become a pastor, you get a secret pastor decoder ring that you can actually lay on the Bible. And when you lay it on the Bible, you hold it up to the sun. And when you turn it, it tells you what to talk about that week. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, that's not true. Um, some of you are like, whoa, mm, good, whoa, no. No, no, not true. I'll, I'll tell you a secret. This is what I do. I usually have my Bible, laptop, iPad, study materials, maybe some books that I've been reading lately. And this is what I do. God, what do you want me to talk about? That, that, that's what I 
that too. And then all of a sudden, these ideas come, these thoughts, these feelings. Sometimes God gives me like a phrase to, that, that I then focus on, and that phrase develops into a whole message or sometimes an entire series. And, and that's what I do. And, and here's the thing is that I need a wonderful counselor to give me advice and to give me direction and, and show those things to me. And guess what? My life is no different than yours. When you're trying to close a deal, when you're trying to talk to clients at work, when you're doing those things, you should pause and say, God, what should I say to these people? How should I convey this information? Well, what points of our product do I need to emphasize? If you ask, we have this wonderful counselor that will help us. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom... That's me, okay? If you lack wisdom, just go ahead and raise your hand. Just admit it and just say, I need some wisdom in this place, right? So if any of you lacks wisdom, what should we do? We should ask God. Why? Because he gives generously to all. Get this, without finding fault, it will be given to you. Without finding fault. I was thinking about that because I don't know who you have in your life, but sometimes you need help with something and you ask them and they treat you like you're stupid for asking. It's like, I don't know if you have computer problems and maybe you've got a, a son or a daughter or somebody younger and you say, hey, this isn't working. How does my iPad do this? Or why isn't this working? And they're like, what is wrong with you? You don't know. What, I've shown you this seven times. And they find fault with us even asking for help. That's not the way God is. God is open and welcoming us to come come and to ask him. And so you and I, we have this wonderful counselor for the decisions that we need to make in life. Number two says that we have this mighty God, and that means for the demands of life, I have a mighty God. There are challenges in life that are too great for you. There are challenges in life that are too great for me, and we're not meant to carry the weight of that. We have a mighty God that is there to, to carry the things and to do the things in our lives that we can't do for ourselves. You can't control other people. You can't control circumstances. You can't control a lot of things. But we can trust that we have a mighty God that is working on our behalf to bring all things together for our good because he has a plan for us and because he loves us and because we're submitted and surrendered to him, then a mighty God is fighting on our behalf. We have this mighty God. This is what it says in Isaiah 40, 29. It says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. I don't know who need to hear that today. You felt worn out. You felt tired. You're thinking, I can't keep up this pace. I can't do this any longer. Man, you feel like quitting. You feel like just drawing back. We have this mighty God that's working on our behalf. He gives strength to the weary and increased power to the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. A young man stumbles and falls, but those who hope in the Lord, he will what? He'll renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and will not faint. We have this power source in our lives, this mighty God that is cheering us on, that's driving us forward and will help us overcome those weary times in life, those tired times in life. And we can trust in him to do that in our lives. For the demands of life, we have a mighty God. Number three says that Jesus is this everlasting father and for my destiny in life, I have an everlasting father for my destiny in life, where I'm going in life. I was thinking about the everlasting father and the love of a father. What's sad is that in our culture, we have this epidemic of fatherlessness in our culture. And there's a lot of absent fathers. There's a lot of disconnected fathers that maybe they're there, but they're not really there. Uh, that, that maybe some fathers that aren't the example that they need to be. I know in some demographics, uh, the, the rate of births that don't have a father at home uh, sometimes surpass 70% in some areas, in some demographics, and that's just not healthy. Uh, and so I was thinking about that idea of father, and I was thinking of my own life, and the example that my dad was to me, 
in shaping me of who I'm supposed to be and, 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 and bringing out the best parts of me for my destiny and, and calling me into who I'm supposed to be. And fathers are good at that. Fathers are supposed to help mold and direct us into who we're supposed to be. And I was thinking about that in my own life, that, that, that there are these times that, that dad would say, hey, Jesse, you're a shook and shooks act this way. You're a shook, and shooks treat people this way. A father speaks that into the children to put a standard and say, hey, that's not who you are. When I do something kind of stupid, <laughs> then the dad would pull me to the side and say, hey, Jesse, you're a shook. Shooks don't act like that, okay? That's not the way we live in our house. And a father does that. And even with my kids, I do that where I've told my kids this, and this is just standard in our house, is we don't call each other names. Not in our house. The shooks don't call names to each other. I'd say the shooks don't scream at each other. The shooks don't yell at each other. You don't treat your sister that way. You don't treat your brother that way. You don't talk back to your mom. That's not the way we live. Why? Because I'm wanting to draw something out of them that God has put in them for the destiny that he has for them. And I want to shape them. And I want to mold them. And we have this everlasting father that, that does that in our lives to, to guide us and to direct us and to create us into the ultimate person that he wants us to be and not to just leave us where we are, but pull out that greatness that he created us for. And, and I was thinking about that because dads do that. You know, dads set boundaries. That, that's one of the things that fathers do is they set boundaries. I don't know if this was your uh, experience growing up or maybe in your household with your own kids, but, but you're wrestling and you're playing and then all of a sudden the kid bites you or pinches you or, or does an illegal move and all of a sudden you're like, fine, stop, we're done. We're not wrestling anymore. I do that. I'm like, no. Why? Because that's a boundary. You crossed it. You're not supposed to win. Okay. And so, so I don't know. I don't know how you do that. In your, but, but we set boundaries and we say, hey, that's not the way we do it. And may, maybe for you, uh, uh, dads oftentimes uh, help build confidence in, in, in children. The, the, get, dads will say, swing higher. You can do it. They'll say, jump further. You won't fall. You might, but you'll get back up. Right. And, and we create confidence. So run faster, try harder, climb higher. You can make it to the top of the tree go for it and the mom's like no don't tell him to do that but but dad's like just draw that out dads do that dads protect you mess with my kids you're messing with me man and, and i was thinking about that that in jesus he's called an everlasting father he's our everlasting father he has this desire for us to reach the destiny that he's put inside of us in isaiah 40 27 i want you to listen to this idea of how much God cares for us like a father ought to care for his ch children, for his family, it says, oh, Jacob, and one of the things you can do with your Bible is you can make it personal and insert yourself if you want, so I'll do that. Oh, Jesse, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, or we could say, oh, Shook family, how can you say God ignores your rights? You, have you not heard? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. We have this God that loves us, that wants to produce the future in our lives that he designed us for, that he created us for. And for our destiny in life, we have an everlasting, a loving father. Number four, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And for the disturbances in life, I have the Prince of Peace. There's things that we go through in life that trouble us, that hurt us, that cause maybe some emotional turmoil in our lives. And we need some peace in our lives. And Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He's this gift that God has given us. You know, you and I, we don't have to worry about things, which we talked about in our last series about fear of being a liar. And we read a scripture that I want to read again. It's Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ 
Jesus. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. And maybe you kind of section off your life a little bit and you kind of compartmentalize things. And when you're at church on a Sunday, you, you seek God and you ask him for your help spiritually to, to do some things. And then maybe in certain circumstances in life, when things get bad enough, you start to seek God's face and say, hey, help me with this. I want to ask you to do something. And think about all that Jesus has to offer you. Don't compartmentalize these little things. And you say, Jesus, have complete reign in my life. I want to experience everything that you have for me. Every solution that you have for every issue that I'm facing in every area of my life, God, I give you permission to move. I seek you. I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. I need your plan for my life. Because this is what I know, is that Jesus is not single faceted caring for you. He cares for everything that you face. And he's got advice, he's got help to provide in every single area of life. Let's pray. God, thank you for this message. God, thank you for reminding us of how amazing Jesus is in the things that he wants to do and work in our lives. God, I pray right now as we think about these scriptures and we think about these names that you're called, that God, we don't have to see you as just one single sliver of an answer, but God, you're the entire answer. You're the entire solution for everything in life. Lord, I know that as pastor, there's people here today that are going through some things that they need you to show up in their life, to rescue them in ways that they can't rescue themselves, to to move in their life to do things they can't do. God, you are the solution and the answer for the thing that they're facing. So Lord, I pray as we open our hearts to you, as we invite you in, that God, you would begin to move and do what only you can do. As we're praying, if you're here today and you would admit that there's some areas in your life where you need God to move, that you maybe you've been trying to handle it on yourself, but let's be honest, you're not equipped to deal with it and to solve it. And today you would surrender that to him and say, Jesus, do your work in my life. I'll surrender to you. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Leave your hands up. I see your hands. I see your hands. God, you don't, even, you don't only see the hands that are raised. God, you see their hearts. God, you see every aspect of the issue that has been bothering them, the issues and challenges that they've been facing. And God, they are not greater than you. God, you are a mighty God. God, the the things that we face and hardships we face, God, they have nothing in comparison to your greatness, to your goodness. And so God, I ask that you would move in each one of their lives. That God, as we don't just raise our hands, but God, we surrender our lives to you. That God, we invite you to come in and do what only you can do and bring victory to those areas in life that we've been struggling. God, it's not in our own strength, God. We put it into your hands and God, you fight for us and God, you bring about the victory. And God, we have open hearts and open ears to listen to you and then to walk out in obedience what you call us to in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand this morning.